have been in this series about the old you and talking about how to leave the past behind. And this morning was our last lesson in this series as we've been looking at these pictures of taking off the old clothes, putting away the former life, and putting on these new clothes that have been created for us in the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And so today's lesson then is, is do you wear beautiful clothes? And as was just read for us, we're going to be in Ephesians 4 at the very end of that chapter as well as moving into chapter 5. And what you see the Apostle Paul doing here is he continues to describe this putting on and putting off picture. There are things in our lives that are being put behind us, set aside, take them off like filthy clothes, and not put them back on, but rather put on these new clothes. And we, we've challenged ourselves through this series that we know that old clothes, familiar clothes, are comfortable, and we want to put them back on sometimes, and God is saying, I've got better clothes for you to wear. And the picture here that's given to us, perhaps is the most powerful of all, I know, as we've gone through this, all of them have been gut punches of sorts of what God is calling us to do and putting away the old life and putting on these new clothes. And, and there are some very challenging words that are given to us in this paragraph as well. You'll note in verse 31, I would just summarize verse 31 as you got to remove these ugly clothes. We'll listen to the words that are given. I want all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander to be put away from you along with all malice. Those are ugly things. <laughs> I just want all of those things to be put away from you. I want bitterness gone, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, along with all malice. And I wanted to stop on the first word for a minute because I think that one perhaps is, is awfully challenging to say. I want all bitterness to be removed from you. And, and you know what bitterness is. I don't need to break out big definitions to you. So I'd rather just ask you this. Is there somebody you've been bitter about? And you would think about somebody in your life, perhaps it's your work or it's your marriage or your parents or your children or your friends or another Christian that you have bitterness toward. I want you to see what Paul starts off with is something awfully challenging. And sometimes those are things that we can read and go, well, it's okay for us to have some bitterness. You don't know what they did. You don't understand the circumstances. There are all these things that were going on. But notice there's no excuses, no loopholes. He doesn't say, let all bitterness be removed from you. You know, unless they're really mean, you know, unless they say something really unkind, they're really a jerk, and, you know, that's, that's okay, you know. And that's usually how we work through that. I want you to see the new clothes, the, the picture of belonging to God and wearing these, these new clothes is about putting away all bitterness. And, and what ultimately I think happens is that as we allow bitterness to reside within us, you see the other things come out. You notice the wrath and anger and slander and clamor. Those usually are symptoms of the problem of bitterness. Something that he addressed earlier in this paragraph, you remember he said, do not let the sun go down on your anger. Why do you need to deal with a problem right away? Because if you don't, that bitterness is usually the first quality that comes in. And then once bitterness happens, what happens? Well, then we have all kinds of sinful anger responses, and that's what's described next. Clamor, making a lot of noise, slamming, uh, throwing things, uh, uh, wrath, outbursts of wrath, yelling, uh, tantrum. When all these kinds of things are given to us and told to us, this is not how the people of God handle problems and difficulties. It's not how they handle anger. And I think that's important to see. Is all of these are different words, essentially trying to put your finger on the way we often deal with our bitterness and our sinful anger. Wrath. We're going to let them have it. Clamor. That's, that's a great word. 
When you read clamor, it, 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 it's one of those noise-making things. You're angry, you make noise, right? Bang a thing, slam a thing. That's what clamor is. Clamor is the noise-making. Slander. We say something about them. Boy, that person's a real jerk. Are you telling anybody else about all that person what they do? I want you to see, he just gives us the strong picture here that none of these things are justified. None of them are justified as the people of God. These are old clothes. This is the former way of life. This is not how we live. This is not how we handle difficulties of anger. None of them are excused. And perhaps the best summary of it is the last line in verse 31, with all malice. Malice is an interesting word. Malice just carries the idea of ill will, mean-spirited, or essentially the opposite of a virtue or moral excellence. It's, ugh, I want something bad toward them. Which, if we are honest, is ultimately what we're doing, right? Is that not why we yell at somebody or are slanderous or slam something or vent our wrath? Is because it's it's ill will. You, you you deserve my anger. You deserve my wrath. All of those things are not excused by God, and we need to put those in the category of unacceptable before God. Not the way to handle our circumstances. That's the old life. That's the old clothes, and we're not allowed to go back into that. Rather, notice what the new clothes look like in the very next line. Verse 32, he says, Be kind to one another and tenderhearted. Some translations, compassionate. Now think about that picture. So whatever is going on, I want all bitterness, all slander, all wrath, all anger, all clamor, with all malice removed from you, and rather, here's what I want you to do. I want you to be kind. I want you to be kind. And I want you to be compassionate. Whatever is happening, whatever is going on, whatever the difficulty, whatever the circumstance, I don't want you to do what you normally do. I want you to be kind. Now, if we would just frame that as our operating system for life going forward. Stop the malice, stop the bitterness, stop the anger, stop the slander, stop the clamor, stop all that, and just be kind. And I know what your response is, because it's the same as mine, but you don't understand. All right, Jesus is going to take that away from us. Luke chapter 6, verse 35. Here's what Jesus says. It's not the first part, the second part. Love your enemies and do good. Lend expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. Here's what I want you to hear about him. I'm talking about God. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. You see what I want to do? <clears throat> is I want to say, I only have to be kind to the people who are grateful and good. All right? But if they're ungrateful and evil, then I can have anger, bitterness, slander, clamor, malice. And those are all okay now, right? And I want you to see the character of God here, where God is telling us, here's what I do. Even to the ungrateful and to the evil, God is kind. He does good. Remember the early scripture, he causes it to rain on the just and the unjust, the righteous and the unrighteous. God does good to everyone. And we so often cut this line of who is worthy of my kindness and who is worthy of my wrath. And I want you to see what he says here. I want you to love your enemies and do good. Why? Why should I do all that? Why should I expect nothing in return? Why is that? Because that's who God is. Because God is kind. And he is even kind to the ungrateful. And he is even unkind to the evil. 
And I want us to think about what a difference that would really look like in our world today if we would apply that. That first, it that causes us to realize we have to change how we look at other people. Because if we are honest with ourselves, why do we get angry and why do we have bitterness and why do we have wrath and clamor and malice and bitterness and why does all that happen except, be honest now, I'm thinking about myself. The reason I get bitter is I'm thinking about what happened to me. The reason I get angry is because I'm thinking about what happened to me. The reason I think clamor is okay because I'm thinking about what happened to me. And the reason I'm malicious is because I'm thinking about what happened to me. So we have to change our perspective if we're going to do what God says, which is to be kind even to the evil, even kind to the ungrateful. Notice there's no reciprocity there. There's no, well, they did good, and so now there you go. This is not the picture. God is forwardly doing good, and that is the picture of us and how different our world would ultimately be. And I want us to think perhaps in no time in our memories, perhaps, could it be more useful for us to be kind in this culture. Because there's a lot of unkindness. There's a lot of hatred. There's a lot of animosity. There's a lot of gritting of teeth. There's a lot of friction right now. And how different we can be shining as lights that we can just simply be kind and tender-hearted and compassionate even when we feel like the person is deserving of our wrath, bitterness, anger, clamor, maliciousness, and the like. This is ultimately what is pictured to us as the character of of God. It is such an important picture that is given to us right. that we would just simply be kind, that we could be nice, that we would be able to do good, to care about people, to be compassionate. And no matter what is happening, that we would train ourselves to realize that that is ultimately the right response, that the new clothes are not about responding in kind to somebody, not doing to them what they just did to us, but to ultimately respond with kindness and compassion. That's what leads perhaps into the hardest part of all, verse 32, where she says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Now, it is important that we talk about this one carefully because I believe the concept of forgiveness has been such a misunderstood concept and such a misunderstood term. In the religious world as well as just in culture in general, that what God is talking about in regards to forgiveness is far harder than how we typically explain it and define it. Because when we talk about forgiveness, what we usually mean if we say, I forgive someone is... I'm not bitter to them, and I'm not angry, and I'm not wrathful, and I'm not going to clamor, or have slander, or malice. But notice that was a whole separate sentence. We have come to define forgiveness in our culture today as, well, I'm not going to punch them back in the mouth. I forgive them. I'm not bitter. That means I forgave them. Or I'm not slamming things, so I have forgiven them. Or I'm not angry, therefore I have forgiven them. And I want this to sum up, that's not forgiveness. There is never a condition that we've just noted where we're allowed to be bitter, angry, clamoring, slandering. Well, that's, they just said that's completely removed from us. Instead, I want you to be kind and compassionate and to forgive one another. Forgiveness is not about, well, I don't harbor ill will toward that person. That was the back prior sentence. Getting rid of all maliciousness. Don't be malicious. No malice. 
But now we're pushing forward and we're talking about well, what is forgiveness ultimately about? And what I want you to do is just think about for a minute God's perspective. Because notice verse 32 says, I want you to forgive one another as God in Christ forgave you. That God is the model here. And I want us to think about that when God forgives, what does that look like? When God forgives you, is all that is happening is, well, God's not bitter at you, and he's not angry at you anymore, he's not wrathful at you anymore, and he doesn't, you know, slam the cabinets about you anymore, and he's not malicious to you anymore, or slanderous. No. Not really, is it? No, when God forgives, the debts he raised and the relationships restored. That's what forgiveness is all about. Forgiveness in terms of God is the relationship is put back. A fracture has happened because of our sin. And forgiveness means that debt has been erased. It's let go. It's sent away. And the relationship can now come back together. Reconciliation. Relationship restored. That is what forgiveness is. And too often we have lowered the bar of forgiveness or we just said, well, I just don't want to punch you in the mouth. I'm such a forgiving person. That's not forgiveness. You're not bitter. Good. You're not malicious. Good. But forgiveness is a whole nother level. It's a whole nother aspect of what is being told to us about what this looks like and what we are supposed to do. And so how are we to forgive like God forgave us? I, not only this passage, think about how many times God tells you to forgive others because God has forgiven you. To offer forgiveness and to be a forgiving person because God has forgiven you. I mean, you don't have to go very far into the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus gives a, here's how you pray. Forgive our debtors, right? Forgive us of our debts as we forgive others of them. God's always talking about the need to put the relationship back together and to send the debt away. How does God forgive? The biggest thing you see in the character of God about what it means to forgive is a proactive Reconciliation. Proactive reconciliation. What we see with God and forgiveness is not him sitting back in heaven, crossing his arms and saying, whenever those human beings finally decide to come crawling on their knees, groveling back to me, I might send my son. That's how we do forgiveness, right? I'm going to sit here, bitter, angry, <laughs> with my arms crossed. When they finally say enough magic words and grovel enough and enough sorries and promises and whatever else they could possibly conjure up, then we'll talk. God, before any of us cared about reconciliation, gave us a Proactive, proactively trying to restore the relationship. That is the image of what is given to us. The idea of us forgiving just as God in Christ forgave us is here we are attempting to correct or restore what is broken. We are the ones proactively doing that. You remember how many times Jesus had to tell us that? If your brother sins against you, sit back on your haunches with your arms crossed until they come groveling back to you. Second Habakkuk chapter 5. If your brother sins against you, you go to them. Why? Proactive reconciliation. We are the ones who are extending and saying we want to fix this. We don't want the fracture. We don't want there to be 
a separation. We don't want there to be a problem. We don't want this to be something that destroys this relationship. Let's reconcile. Let's figure this out. Here's what happened. And I want to be able to solve it. This is what Jesus means when he talks about blessed are the peacemakers. Peacemakers in regards to what? Relationships. You're the one attempting to create the peace, not cause the destruction, not make the fracture worse. This is what God means when he tells us to forgive others, is that we are seeking to put that back together. Now, how hard is that? And as soon as you stumble upon how hard that is, just remember how hard was that for God for you? What did you just do to deserve forgiveness? What have you done to offer back to God for all that he's done for you and how we've completely wrecked the relationship and fractured and blown it to pieces? See, that's what God's trying to get at. This forgiveness is about canceling a debt and saying, let's put this back together. And obviously, then, if we're forgiving others as God has forgiven us, we have to also recognize Forgiveness doesn't exist when there's no desire to repair the relationship. Think about that with God. If you don't want a relationship with God, can he forgive you? No. Why? Because you don't want a relationship. There's nothing to forgive. That's the concept of forgiveness. We've unfortunately turned forgiveness into like this internal therapeutic thing. That's not what's happening. If that's bitterness, clamor, and anger, and slander, and maliciousness, that, that's that over there. You're not supposed to ever do that. that that's, that's no, no. But forgiveness is trying to put the thing back together again. That's what God is doing, right? Over and over again, what's God doing? I want a relationship. I want a relationship with you. I want a relationship. Let, let's fix this. What do people over and over again do? No, no, no. And the scriptures say God is patient, long-suffering, and keeps asking for the relationship. Keeps trying to put it back together. Keeps saying, come back to me, come back to me. That's the beauty of God's relationship with Israel in the Old Testament, right? Israel breaks it over and over and over and over and over again. And what does God keep doing? Come on back, come on back. Think about when Peter asked the question, how often do, should I forgive my brother when they come back to me and repent? Up to seven times? I don't know if we'd even take one. Right? Restore this relationship? Cancel the debt? Put it back together again? Move forward? Are you kidding me? Peter goes seven times, right? Jesus goes, you just keep doing it. Doesn't matter. Because that's how God forgives you. God's not keeping a list of how many times you've broken the relationship and He's had to restore it. Good thing, huh? Are we in the millions yet? <laughs> how many times has God had to restore the relationship that we've broken? That's forgiveness. That's the essence of what we are talking about. Is that we are proactively wanting. To fix the relationship. We are proactively trying to restore that. We are trying to put it back together again. That's our desire. Obviously, if they don't want the relationship, there's nothing you can do about it, but we're not supposed to be the cause of it. We're not supposed to be the cause. We're supposed to be the ones building the bridge. We're supposed to be the peacemaker. We're supposed to be the one forgiving. We're supposed to be the one reaching out. We're supposed to be the one going to the one who has sinned against us. We're the ones who proactively attempt reconciliation because that's what God did. That's what forgiveness looks like. Like I told you, that's a whole lot harder than how we would like it. But that's what God's called us to do because that's how God forgave you. If you ever have a question of how to do forgiveness, just remember, how did God forgive you and do it like that? No, he 
easy. But power. So no bitterness, no anger, no clamor, no wrath, no slander, no maliciousness. Be kind, tender hearted, forgive, just as God in Christ forgave you. If that were not enough, verse 1 of chapter 5, therefore be imitators of God. What God did for you, I want you to go do. Therefore, imitate God. And then he gives a second picture of that. He says, be imitators of God as beloved children. Can I say it like this? We're supposed to look like children of God. How do the old clothes show us to be children of God? If we go back to those old clothes and the former way of life and treating people the way we used to, saying things the way that we used to, how does that show that we are children of God? That's one of the funniest things about having children, is they copy you. For the good and for the bad. <laughs> the good traits, and unfortunately the bad traits too, are like, no, no, don't do that. I, I know I do that, don't do that. <laughs> That's not right. We imitate God as children of God. We look at him and model him, imitate him, and therefore we are representing him. We're following his example. We are walking in his footsteps. We have a saying in, in our culture, a couple of sayings. We'll say someone is a chip off the old block or the acorn doesn't fall far from the tree or if you're being a little medium, the nut doesn't fall far from the tree, but however you use that phrase. The idea is that the child is just like the parent. Think about that idea. Well, if we are children of God, being transformed into his likeness. The way we handle problems, the way we talk to people, the way we behave, things that, are, that we do would ultimately show that we are wearing beautiful clothes, not ugly clothes, because we're children of God. That's what is adoring us. People see these beautiful clothes of kindness and compassion and forgiveness because we're the people of God, because we're imitating God, because we understand what God has done for us. And if this were not enough, let me give you verse 2, because Paul just doesn't let up off the gas on this one. I mean, he just keeps pushing and pushing. Look at verse 2. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Finally, here's what your new clothes look like. I want you to love like Christ loved. This is read the passage and smile because it just hurts. It's just good. Oh man. Here's what true love looks like. I want you to live in love just like Christ loved you. And if you weren't sure how Christ loved you, he completed the picture by saying, and gave himself up as a fragrant offering sacrifice to God. We're going to love others. That means we completely sacrifice ourselves. Oh, look at Philippians that we've been doing for Sunday morning class. The sacrifice. Putting on the new clothes means we don't think about ourselves, but walking in love. We give ourselves. We're not thinking selfishly. Selfishness is what generates all these sinful activities and thoughts that we're seeing pointed out in Ephesians chapter 4 from anger and bitterness and slander and clamor and corrupting words. All of those things come from selfishness. We're not thinking of self, but we are giving ourselves up just as Christ gave himself up for us. If we were to use Romans 12, this is what it means to present ourselves as a living sacrifice to God. This is what being a living sacrifice to God looks like. I'm going to be kind, compassionate, I'm going to be forgiving, I'm going to imitate God, I'm going to live my life like a child of God, and I'm going to love like Christ loved us, because I'm going to give myself just as he gave himself, because that's what it means to be a living sacrifice. That's the huge picture of what is given to us in this section. 
And so we're going to talk about leaving the past behind. This all began by needing a new way of thinking. You remember that back in chapter 4, verse 17? That was a while ago. But I'll reverse this and remind us for a minute. Back in chapter 4, verse 17, where we talked about our thinking is broken. Don't walk like the Gentiles walk, outsiders, the laws, who are futile in their thinking and darkened in their understanding. Our way of thinking, we come into Christ and this relationship is broken. The way that we've always been taught and what our culture tells us and what everybody says to do is not what God says. And so it begins with a new way of thinking. So don't go back to those old clothes. Don't go back to the old way of life. And I want you just as we conclude this series just to think back over those old clothes. And ask where those old clothes have put you in life. Has your anger made things better? Your corrupting speech made things better in your life? Deceiving others made things better in your life? Thinking like the world made your life so much better? Bitterness, wrath, malice, clamor, slander has made things better in your life? I do want us to think about those old clothes and realize those things make things worse. Those have never made the relationship better. They've never made life better. They've always made things worse. So get rid of the corrupting talk. Get rid of the anger. Get rid of the slander. Get rid of the, the poor thinking. Get rid of all of that because it's only making things worse. You're going to leave the past behind and move forward in this new life. We have to admit those old clothes don't work. That's why God wants you to leave them behind. They're only hurting you. They're only hurting others. They're only making life worse. Throw those old clothes behind and wear the clothes that God wants you to wear. What a difference things will truly be if we're practicing kindness, practicing compassion, practicing forgiveness, and not going back to those old ways. Those old ways are destructive. Those old ways lead to your eternal destruction. It is those things that the wrath of God stands against. If we had time, we know, but if you wanted, you could go from verse 3 and just keep going for the rest of chapter 5 and just notice he keeps listing more things we need to stop doing. But I'll just give you a verse 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes on the sons of disobedience. These old clothes cannot be a part of our wardrobe if we are going to belong to the people of God. We must cast them aside and go forward with a new life, with new clothes in the ways of God. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for these warnings that you give to us. Because, Lord, it is easy for us to go back into the old way of thinking and put on these old attitudes and these old actions. God, forgive us for our sinful anger, forgive us for bitterness, clamor and slander, forgive us for having ill will, forgive us for not being kind, forgive us for not being compassionate, forgive us for not being forgiving, forgive us for not walking in love. Lord, you show us the glaring holes that are in our lives and in our hearts. Lord, we pray not only for forgiveness, but that you would strengthen our minds and strengthen our will to put on the new clothes that you've given to us in righteousness. Lord, help us to be kind. Help us to be compassionate.
compassionate, help us to be tender-hearted, help us to be forgiving, help us to be proactive in our reconciliation, help us to love, help us to sacrifice ourselves, help us to stop thinking about ourselves. Help us to be the children that you want us to be so that we can shine as lights of this world around us. So Lord, please use us, transform us, change us, mold us into what you want us to be. And thank you for your patience. And thank you for forgiving us for the myriads upon myriads upon multitudes upon countless times that we have failed and sinned against you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for always being there. Thank you for never leaving us, even in all of our mess. Give us strength to be far better servants of you in the days ahead than we have in the past. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We'll sing the invitation song. We do invite you to come to Jesus. The opportunity is amazing for all of our sins, for all of our failures, for all of our shortcomings, for all of our wrong memories. Here is God proactively still saying to you, come to me. I still want a relationship with you. Now, I know you made a mess. It's okay. I know you've blown everything up. That's all right. I still want to have a relationship with you. That's the love of God on display in Christ. He forgives. He wants you to come to him with all of your heart. Can we help you do that today in any way? Would you let us know? Would you come? Will we sing? Will we sing? Take the name of Jesus Christ.